My first question is, look, we have just, most of us, I presume, have just come through a weekend of 4,000 like-minded atheists at the convention. And uh, uh, there was a sense that, and some of the commentators have suggested, that this really is part of the emergence of a new movement, something like the 1960s and 1970s movement, a bit of a social revolution. Um, if it is that, are believers left out of this new movement by definition, the, this re-emergence, or not re-emergence, the rise of new atheism, are believers left out? Go, Go for it. Okay. Yes, I, I'm in charge. I've got it. Uh, first of all, is this a new movement? And that's a tricky question because really this movement is as old as the Enlightenment and David Hume. So it's, I guess in geological terms, it's new. But <laughs> otherwise, it's, it's not. The, the one new thing is that you know, if, if our governments and if our social institutions actually adopted the radical idea of using evidence-based rational thinking, that would be really new. That would be strange. That would be wonderful. Um, the question of, of whether we can, we, whether believers will belong in it, you know, that's a peculiar question too. Because, you know, if I were forming an orchestra, would you ask me if I would allow people who don't use an instrument to join? <laughs> if I'm hiring for my lab, would it be reasonable to ask? Well, you're going to let ignorant people who know nothing about science to work in the lab? And I, you know, the answer is both yes and no, that no, I'm not going to let them get on there, but everybody has an equal chance to learn this stuff and to contribute. So yes, the believers can join us once they grow up and give up the supernatural fairy tales. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Leslie. Oh, okay. This... It is on, so oh, you, you have to, yeah, you have to, to do okay, the... So nobody heard what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I actually was going to invite Chris to go first. Sure. It's on. Is this on? Okay. So that's an interesting question. I mean, I tend to think the answer um, is in one respect, yes, and in one respect, no. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. You know, in, in, on the one hand, you know, this um, really growing, energetic, robust movement of non-theists of all stripes, um, you know, we're organizing around a shared identity. Um, and with that, you know, a, a set of some shared values as well. And in terms of the shared I identity piece, you know, maybe religious believers won't be a part of the movement in that respect because they don't share in that identity. But if we're looking at what our values are, what the values are that the movement of rationalists, atheists, agnostics, skeptics, and free thinkers, what are some of the values we're sharing? And what are some of the values we're trying to promote? We have, um, you know, we, we have to work with religious believers when we're talking about promoting those values because a lot of them are shared by religious believers and because though this movement is growing quickly, though it is, you know, rapidly gaining a lot more prominence and, um, and is really having a significant influence in the world, we don't have the numbers yet. We really need people from all different backgrounds to work together around the agenda that we want to promote. So, you know, no, they're not, probably not going to be coming to the convention um, if, if we're simply saying this is a, you know, a gathering of people who share this identity, but if we're saying we want to have conversations about these important issues and about the values that we're working to advance, then yeah. I think we have to work with religious believers in that respect. Yeah, I guess what's interesting to me is, is how do we define those values? So um, a few years ago when, when the atheist conference, the first atheist conference happened, um, I got up and I talked first about this idea of identity because when I got asked to be um, to speak at the atheist conference, I didn't know whether or not I should because I'd never thought of myself as an atheist. So if, I, if someone had asked me, you know, how would you define yourself, I would have said I'm a secular Jew. But then when I thought about it, I thought, well, I guess that means I'm an atheist because <laughs> I don't really believe in the religious part of being Jewish. But at the same time, you know, a, a few years ago, I rang up an old boyfriend of mine because I do go back and forth um, from the United States, you know, 
from Australia to the United States, and when I get there, I like to talk to people who it's too expensive to talk to. Otherwise, of course, this is all pre-Skype. Um, <laughs> but, but that's what I would do. And, and when I spoke to him, he said to me, oh, you know, I'm not a Catholic anymore. I'm an Anglican now. <laughs> And I, I, that really threw me for some reason because it, for me it would have been like saying, oh, I'm, I, I'm not a Jew anymore. I've decided I'm going to be Polish. Um, and, and next week I'm going to be Italian. You know, to me it just doesn't seem a negotiable part of, of part of my identity because when I say that I'm Jewish, it's sort of telling you some sort of story about where my parents come from and that bit just isn't negotiable. So, you know, for me to take on the idea of being an atheist, so I got asked again to, to be in the conference and that was really exciting. I got my own berth instead of being on the women's panel where I only got 10 minutes. Um, and I wanted to do it. I wanted to talk to people who I... I feel like, you know, they're, they're going to be responsive to my message, but I guess the, the message that I have, the thing that I would like us to organise around, the bit that matters to me and the reason why I like to come to the conference, is I want to talk about the separation of church and state. Um, and I know that that's something definitely that religious people, some religious people will be on board about. I'm, I'm pretty convinced it's in fact the majority um, because they came up with the idea in the first place. They're the ones who came up with the idea of religious freedom and the notion of secularity and of having a space in which nobody's religion got to be there in order that everybody could have the freedom to believe. And perhaps at the time they weren't thinking about and not believe as they like, but nonetheless that notion can definitely be easily inserted in there. And so in terms of what I would like our agenda to be, definitely we can have them and we should have them and indeed we can't win without them. I know that there are some uh, religiously oriented people in this audience and I really encourage you to, to think about questions uh, because we will leave plenty of time at the end to uh, have interaction with the panel. PZ, I want to just direct a, a question to you. That's special. Okay. Yeah. No, I'll get to the others later. Yeah, I'm oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, not to put too fine a point on it, you've called the interfaith movement Tinkerbellism. Sounds about right. And you've characterised Chris Steadman as a soppy interfaith wanker. <laughs> Not to put too fine a point on it. Do you want to tell us what you really think? <laughs> I think you just did. <laughs> Well, no, Please you know, explain. Yes, uh, you know we, all of us here in this in this last last go round, we we were talking about values, right? And that values are very important to us, and I, and I agree entirely. But I think the first and foremost value I have as an atheist is to the truth. So when I see the word faith, I want to punch somebody. <laughs> Faith, you know, the, the value of a scientist and an atheist and a skeptic is doubt. It's the exact opposite of faith. Faith is, is anathema to us, if I can use a religious word. And yet here we are, we're under the banner of interfaith, and I find that extremely objectionable. That what we ought to be doing is, you know, the, the word we want is secular. Secularism is what we can support in common cause with the religious. It has nothing to do with interfaith crap, okay? <laughs> and, and so what I would like to see is more of that, where, you know, what we do is, is we say clearly, okay, there are certain things we agree on, like, like uh, equality for women, equality for races, equality for, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, we want to protect the environment. These are all secular things that I can share with many religious people except when they tell me that it's got to be done as part of interfaith. Oh, ick. <laughs> just can't, I just can't stand the word. It makes me ill. <laughs> okay, I think he, we've got where he stands. <laughs> Chris, do you want to respond? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I was very surprised to hear a fellow Minnesotan use the word wanker. I don't think I've ever heard that in Minnesota before. And, and what did you mean by soppy? Do you mean like sweaty? Yes. I, I, I mean like, like gooey like jello. <laughs> See, I'm, I think I'm the only Minnesotan who doesn't like jello. <laughs> I actually don't like it. Look, you know, 
I understand the objection to the term interfaith. I, 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 maybe I don't fully understand your objection because I'm not inside your head yet. But, uh, <laughs> Chris. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, I, I, but I've, I've heard many objections to the term interfaith, yours among them. And, you know, I, I, this is something that I, I, you know, I spoke at the Wheeler Center about the work I do on Thursday. And I, I said, you know, I think that the term interfaith is imperfect te uh, terminology. It's not actually descriptive of what occurs um, in interfaith settings. You know, I, I use the term interfaith because that's what's sort of um, in fashion in the United States. That's the term that, and under which these, these projects are occurring. Um, it's the term that the current presidential administration uses. It's the term that's the most widely recognized. And if the content of these events is good, is beneficial to atheists, advances secularism, advances other causes that we really care about and support, and it's occurring under an imperfect banner, but it's gonna happen whether we're there or not, I think it's really important for us to be there. And in fact, if we're not there, then we run the risk of it being an event that is all about faith, that is all about religious values and is not about secular values, is not about uh, the values that um, you know, many atheists hold. And in fact, if we're not participating in these events, then you know, faith could potentially get all the credit. But if we are there, we can actually enter into these situations where people are talking about their religious values and we can disrupt the religious privilege that's present or that says that only religious people have these values that motivate, you know, motivate them to do this work and only religious people care about X, Y, and Z. Um, <laughs> but, if we're, but if we are there and if we are participating, then we take that privilege away and we have the opportunity to say, actually, these are you know, universal values that a lot of people share. And it's as important to atheists and other non-religious folks to ensure that so social progress occurs as it is to anyone else. So I agree to an extent. I think the term is imperfect. But I think by working within these already ongoing efforts, we have the chance to help expand the definition of what it means and potentially change some of the language. For example, there's a an interfaith organization in Massachusetts I've worked with called, that was previously called Social Action Ministries. They've now changed their name to Social Action Massachusetts because they recognized their name wasn't actually reflective of the work that they were doing. So. Okay, it, it, it's a lovely sentiment, the, the idea of undermining them Is from it, within. Can you? Okay, I'll write up no. here. Yeah. Point it at you. Point it at you. Okay. okay. Do you hear me now? It's like you're going to eat it. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is, this is turning into a fun event. Okay. Um, so it, it's, it's a lovely sentiment, and I, I like the idea of undermining from within, but in, in practice, in practice, it doesn't happen. And I can give you a great example. In Morris, Minnesota, you came there a few weeks ago, and I thought you sucked. I really did. It was terrible. Um, this was an event where the, you know, we had organized this big conference. Actually, I should not say we. My students did this. It was a wonderful conference on the science of origins that a group of students at my university put together. They were leaders in doing this, and they put together a phenomenal conference. They got a lot of people coming in. And with this conference, they had the specific goal of you know, not having the little cloistered university group sit there and talk among themselves, but they wanted community outreach. They wanted to bring people from the community in to, to engage in this conversation. And they thought of you. Which is nice. <laughs> okay. I will admit, you have some skills. And they thought of you and thought you would bring, they would, that you would come in. And what they specifically wanted to do was, was some activism, some outreach, getting the community involved. And what really perturbed me is that here were these bright, responsible, diligent students who'd put all this work and leadership in this conference. And you took this section of the, of the event and put it in a church. Well, I, I didn't plan where it was, where the event was occurring. They actually selected the church. As I understand it, they... Um apparently work very closely with um, a representative from that church, and um, it was their decision. I actually had no idea yes. where I would be speaking. But you were brought in to lead this and help contribute. Mm -hmm. What I would have done in your position is I would have said, no, don't put it in the church. 
<laughs> Seriously, I would have said that the, if, if we are going to be leaders, if we atheists are going to be activists, if we're going to be contributors to this whole social organization, we need a place of our own. We need to stand as secular people in response. And what I would have thought would have been really great is if we had said, okay, we're organizing these activities. We had like three activities that were all lined up. We're organizing these activities. The center of the activity is going to be like at the university. And we have brought in this wonderful liaison to the religious community, Chris Stedman. And you would go to the church and you'd say to them, join us. Instead, what you had us do was the atheists join the church, which I find extremely objectionable. And furthermore, that what would happen is when, when we did this event, all of a sudden, all the power, all the leadership was out of the hands of the students and placed once again in a church. Once again, we pretend that the church is a center of moral responsibility, of community interaction. And that's exactly what we have to destroy, is that sense that you can only find these values in the context of religion. I mean, it's interesting that that was your, your read on the situation because I had a, a very different, um, you know, read on, on the day. I mean, I, you know, I, I came in the day before, I got the chance to spend some time at the conference and really enjoyed um, everything that I saw. And then, um, you know, I asked the students where the events would take place the next day and they said that they had planned them in collaboration with a local church and with the Office for Civic Engagement on the campus. And they worked with them to plan these community service programs that were intended to take members of the community um, outside of the school and the students as well and bring them together in an opportunity to do some work together. And they asked me to speak before the service projects. Um, and they told me that they wanted to do it in the church because they wanted to um, really give the members of the general community an opportunity, those who were a member of the church, an opportunity to participate in the conference and they just decided in, in their, you know, in the planning of the conference that they wanted to have it in the church. I'm happy to, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, in these kinds of events, speak where I'm asked to speak. And if having it in the church somehow facilitated reaching out to the members of the general community, particularly members of the religious members of the general community, that is, that's fine with me because I, may, you know, I try to make it very clear when I'm speaking uh, that, you know, where my values come from and what my identity is and how I see the world. So, you know, I understand, um, you know, some reservations for having it in a religious space, but, I, you know, I, I, it's, it, if the efforts are good and if the projects are good, to me, it's less relevant that the speech happened in the church and then we went out into the general community and did okay. the project. So, Chris... <laughs> Last week when you spoke at the Wheeler Centre, there was a question from Debbie Gooden from the um, Centre for Inquiry. And she said, look... It's all very well to, to, to reach out uh, to people in the religious community and to be nice to them. But what actually gets people off their arse and into activism is the extremists, is the people who do uh, make waves. You know, the, the people like PZ, PZ, um, you know, who does, who does get people angry and irritated maybe, but thinking. So it really challenges people's um, uh, cherished beliefs. Do you think that she has a point? I do. I mean, I think, you know, so I remember when I was responding to that question, um, one of the things that I said is, you know, and I, I wouldn't, for, for starters, I wouldn't call PZ an extremist. Um, you know, I would say that... <laughs> You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to try a little harder. You've got some tough competition out there. <laughs> um, yes, I know that. We can. You can just take that one soundbite from this whole event and just cut it out of context and loop it. Me saying I don't think PZ is an extremist. Um, <laughs> I don't. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not sorry that you're not an extremist. Anyway, um, 
you know, but I do think that, you know, when responding to this question, one of the things I said is, look, you know, <clears throat> I think that the most vocal and most, you know, often galvanizing, <clears throat> excuse me, perspectives are the ones that tend to sort of set the tone. Yep. And I remember you referenced, uh, Deb, sorry, you, Debbie's in the audience right now. I remember Debbie referenced um, Rick Santorum, for example, and saying, you know, for a lot of young, you know, secular activists, people like Rick Santorum are the ones who really, you know, get them galvanized Ooh. and get them motivated to work. Uh, you know, but my issue is when people treat Rick Santorum as if he's representative of all Catholics when he's not, because I think that tends to alienate allies that we may have among the ranks of Catholics when we're trying to work to support secularism and the separation of church and state, which, you know, Rick, uh, Rick Santorum so vociferously attacked. Um, and I, I also think that the project of interfaith work, which is very often accused of being uh, kumbaya, or drum circle, or uh, tinker bellism. Is that what I Yeah. Um, and you know, some of us like a good drum circle, but I know not everybody does. Um, but you know, and I think that sometimes interfaith programs do run the risk of be of being very much a sort of gloss over our differences. Let's all be nice. We'll pretend like we all believe the same thing, even though we really don't. Um, and that kind of interfaith is a, is problematic. I mean, I don't think that that interfaith really accomplishes much. But interfaith work, when it's done well, when it acknowledges real differences, but it brings people together around those central values that we are all trying to sort of advance together, what it does is it marginalizes the more extreme perspectives. It marginalizes people like Rick Santorum. It takes the power back from those who are setting the tone and saying, this is what Catholic values are. We need to mobilize people who are Catholic to say, those are not my Catholic values. We need to, you know, essentially take the, the reasonable, you know, moderate, majority and and empower them to be more vocal and to be you know standing up against uh, attacks on our our liberties and our freedoms and our values because it's much you know we heard about this on the, the uh, religion and politics panel at the global atheist convention this week you know so often religious moderates or just moderates in general are accused of not doing enough to speak out or of being complacent or apathetic but the fact of the matter is it's much harder to get your message out there if you're a more moderate perspective. Um, uh, Marion Maddox was talking about you know, all of the sort of progressive Christians that she knows who put out press releases that just get ignored. And people who, like Cardinal George Pell, whose uh, values don't actually represent the majority of Christians in Australia according to the numbers that are available, or groups like the ACL, uh, is that what it is, the ACL? Yeah. Uh, they don't actually represent the majority of Christians in Australia, but they speak for them because their message uh, resonates with a conflict-driven media. So, yeah. I was going to ask, Leslie, would gonna, you sorry. like to come in on this I'm conversation? I'm guessing this is, this is more your area. And, yeah, so. and, and you're exactly right. So, I mean, in fact, one of the things that I'm sort of thinking about as an angle is, in fact, it's actually news to see the work of atheists with religion, because that confounds what people think. They think, oh, right, atheists, they're against religion. And unfortunately, I mean, I, I do spend um, a lot of time working, uh, trying to get my message out, and one of the ways you have to do that is you have to work with the media. So you have to understand the media, and you have to work within its um, extreme limitations. So one of its limitations is what you're suggesting, is that it likes conflict. It likes extremism. And often, as Meredith says, you know, people themselves, that's because often that is the way that we can clarify our own thinking. So I remember a number of years ago, a friend of mine who is, you know, an extremely reasonable person was telling me that she heard me on... Um, Neil Mitchell, speaking to Neil Mitchell on 3AW. Now, I don't normally go on 3AW, but I do sometimes. I'll talk to anybody. I mean, I, I will. I will. I mean, the point is you're trying, and you're not, you're not just trying to preach to the, to the choir. You're, you're trying to, or to the converted. You're trying to reach out to people who normally wouldn't hear what you have to say. But I was extremely surprised that she listened to Neil Mitchell. And so I said so. I said, I can't believe you listened to Neil Mitchell. And she said, you know, he really helps me know what I think, because when I listen to him, I think, I don't think that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a really good thing for me, because often I'm just kind of floating around, sitting on the fence, and all of a sudden I know I don't agree with that. So I think there's something really true about that, and I think in terms of our own, again, you have to go back again and again to, the, to the, what we're trying to achieve here. So, you know, if what we're trying to achieve 
um, is we want to sit in a room and we only want to sit in a room with everybody who agrees with absolutely everything we think because that makes us feel really good. Well, okay, maybe we don't want to sit in a room with, with religious people. But if what we're trying to achieve is actually some kind of change in the world in which we live and share with religious people, um, you know, we're not going to agree with everything a lot of people think. It's not just where we're going to have disagreements with religious people. We're going to have disagreements with other people too, and we are in fact not a we. I'm sure we could wedge many, many differences between a group of people who call themselves atheists. It would take me about five minutes to divide you all up into lots of different groups if we really went down to the nub of what we think about a lot of different things. So what we do in modern campaigning is we form alliances around issues. What is our issue? If our issue is separating church and state, which I tried to make a, a pretty um, complete case, is a huge problem here in, the, um, in Australia and, as I understand in practice, a huge problem in the United States, we have to form alliances with anybody. Bring the dogs, bring the possums, bring the orange people. I don't care who you bring. If they agree with me on this issue and they're willing to put in some, some uh, time and energy to win... What do we want to do? Sit in a room with like-minded people or do we want to win? I want to win. <laughs> I'm quite happy to say it. I want to win. Can I, can I just ask the three of you, though, that uh, the, the new atheist movement, okay, Richard Dawkins and, and the four horsemen, are often accused of being strident and in a way, disrespectful of the other side, of believers. So is this, uh, politically speaking, is it just poor political tactics? If you do want to get people allying together, if you do want to get as many people as possible getting off their asses and, and becoming an activist and working together for the common good, that's another question, what do we mean by the common good? Um, but is it just ineffective political tactics to get them pissed off? It's great politi political tactics. Okay, that's, that's, how, that's how we form our tribe, right? And that's what we're in the midst of doing right now is establishing a new social unit here, the atheist community. And I think that those kinds of, you know, people call them polarizing tactics. But when you're polarizing, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, these guys are the outsiders, we are the insiders, and that's the only way you can build up a group of people, that you have to do that. You have to do that in-group, out-group thing. Uh, and in this case, the, if there's anything strident, if there's anything militant or extreme about it, it's because the other side is a bunch of extreme assholes. <laughs> it's that simple. No, I mean, really, it's... It's gotten to the point where, you know, we new atheists are sitting here wondering why is the entire world insane right now? You know, as, as a really small, simple example of, from my own personal experience, you know, there was this time a couple of years ago where I did this really trivial little thing where I stuck a nail in a cracker and threw it away. It happened to be a consecrated communion wafer. <laughs> and I bragged about it. <laughs> But, you know, that's, it's silly, right? It's, it's utterly trivial. To me, this was a meaningless, meaningless act. And to emphasize that, I also desecrated a Koran at the same time and my holy book from His Holiness Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, threw him in the trash, took a picture, put it on the web. And I thought it was going to die right there. That that was so silly that... <laughs> I figured, I figured there would be a little flash in the pan, a few people would come on, a few more people would come on the blog and complain and complain and complain. But I did not think it would turn into this major event that consumed a big chunk of my university administration for a little while. <laughs> I also did not imagine that I would be going off, off afterwards. You know, I, this happened shortly before I came to Australia last time. I would not, did not imagine I would be going, doing radio interviews here where people would ask me, what kind of insanity is that that you dared to desecrate a cracker? <laughs> you know, the insanity was that there's a couple billion Catholics on this planet who think that cracker is God. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the extremism. 
it's still extremism, even though a vast majority of the planet believes in this nonsense. But here's the thing. Is the fact that they believe the cracker is God really the problem? I would say that that is not the problem. I, I mean, do I agree that the cracker is God? No, I do not agree with them. Do I think it's a little bit silly? Okay, between you and me, I do. But do I need to say that to them? No, I think I do not. And I think it is disrespectful. And I think it is counterproductive because that's not the problem I have with them. The problem I've got is they want to stop me having abortions. The problem I've got is that they're trying to take the, the country that I respect, two of them in fact, that I'm invested in and, and respect, and turn them into places where, because they believe something, I have to do it. That's the problem I've got with them. Let's keep our eye on the ball. The cracker is the stupid bit. Okay, and lots of people have stupid things that they do and they believe. And I'm going to dedicate my life to pointing out how stupid they are. I'd be very, very busy. And I'd be very, very bored. Why would I spend my time doing that? Let's keep our eye on the ball. Job security. <laughs> and I disagree. I disagree. But I, I disagree profoundly with what you just said. The, the cracker is a symptom of a really deep problem. You know, as a sign... Because what it does is it reveals the problem. It exposes the problem. Or it that, exposes that you're just, you know, picking on something that's the symptom rather than the problem. I think it shows you're missing the ball. Uh, no, I disagree. I disagree completely. Because... Oh. Who's got the Here we go. Um, I, no, I, I disagree because you know if, if you read what I wrote at that time, what it was was to point out the hypocrisy of what the church was doing. That at the time I did this act, the church and Bill Donahue were ranting and raving and trying to get this student fired, kicked out of university, for walking off with a communion wafer. So that was first and foremost in my mind: is is if if we have an act that inspires outrage by a religious community and all that rage is focused on one person, the best way to diffuse it is to spread it around. Okay, so can I ask Chris, what's... Yeah. <laughs> Both. <laughs> they literally accused him of kidnapping their Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, and you see, that, that, that's not just... That, that is a symptom, but it's a symptom of something deeply disturbing about the way they're thinking. And that's what we need to highlight, is that it, it's not just, you know, it, it's not just, oh, you like rituals, you go through rituals. No, it's that there's something profoundly wrong with their brains that they are thinking it is so important to worship a cracker, to have this misplaced processing of important things in the world. Okay. We'll, we'll, why don't we, well, hang on. let's wait till the Q&A. We'll wait till the Q&A. How's that yeah. sound? The, there will be lots of time. Yeah. Can you hold your question? Because I just want to, there's a couple of other things I want to get through, and then we'll open it up. Absolutely. That's the point. <laughs> Chris, what's your view about uh, the, the use of provocative statements in order to get people to sit up and listen even if they, even if it is divisive, but at least to get them to think about these issues. Well, I'm still hung up on the fact that you respect the United States, Leslie, <laughs> after living outside of the country for so long. Um, okay, I, I'm, I'm not going to be running for political office ever, so I'll let that statement stand, actually. <laughs> um, you know... I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with Leslie in this respect. I think, you know, I hear a lot about this concept of, um, you know, Overton's window. The more extreme statements make the, you know, more moderate perspective seem that much more moderate. Um, the problem is, <clears throat> with a lot of these discussions about strategy, for the most part, you know, we have some 
we have some social science to, you know, we all sort of trot out our different statistics, but for the most part, we're actually really just exchanging anecdotes. We say, I've seen this work. You know, you say, I've seen this work. And, you know, we're all trying to sort of make the case for what strategies we think are the most effective for advancing our agendas. Um, I tend to be really skeptical of Overton's window um, and how effective it is because the work that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to deconstruct a lot of the negative perceptions that exist about atheists. I'm trying to build uh, cooperation and understanding and I'm trying to, I'm, I, I'm really swimming upstream because in the United States, atheists are viewed you know, with a lot of suspicion and mistrust and outright you know, revulsion and hate. And the, the, I, what I think happens is these extreme, more extreme sounding statements, I know I said you weren't an extremist, but, um, but, <laughs> but that what they end up doing is they actually make the work I'm trying to do a lot harder because people come to associate atheists with the, the most visible, most vocal perspectives. So, you know, what I find myself doing is whenever I go out to um, another university to, to speak and facilitate interfaith dialogue, I find people saying, you know, oh man, like I haven't encountered an atheist who has this kind of perspective before. All I hear is, you know, this more extreme perspective. And it run, what, it, what it does is it runs the risk of people sort of tokenizing me and saying, oh, well, Chris is an exception. You know, Chris is nice, uh, but for the most part, the rest of them aren't, which is, you know, exactly not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, you know, relay the fact that there are, you know, there's a diversity of perspectives among all these different folks. And so, you know, I, I'm not convinced that those extreme statements actually help advance the cause. You know, my mother um, goes to this gym in rural Minnesota, and she is always, you know, meeting strangers there, and they, of course, you know, ask about her children. And when she gets, you know, to me, she says, oh, my son just finished this book, and it's about his experiences, you know, uh, coming out of the closet as a, you know, as a queer person in Minnesota, and she, you know, she never feels nervous describing that part, even though we've, you know, had some major issues in Minnesota around marriage equality and other types of things. And, you know, then she says, and, and now he does interfaith work, and he works with all kinds of people, including, you know, he's a, he's a big advocate for, um, against, you know, a lot of the anti-Muslim sentiment and violence that exists in the United States. And she doesn't feel nervous about that at all, even though there's a lot of uh, mistrust and hate directed towards the Muslim community as well. But when she gets to the part where she explains that I'm an atheist, her voice always catches in her throat and she has to sort of will herself to go on because the reactions that she gets are so extreme. And it's you know, almost always somebody re referencing a time where they have felt dehumanized or, um, you know, or, or, um, or put down by an atheist. So I actually think that those kinds of comments make the work of building cooperation and understanding a lot harder. Okay. It's my fault. In other words. Please say, Good. No, no, wait. Could you please hand over to Leslie? Because I, I just, I'd like to ask, um, I don't actually identify with that uh, extreme view uh, of mistrusting atheists in Australia. And you've got a foot in both camps. You understand both cultures. What's your view about um, the, the difference in the history and the culture between the United States and Australia? And what could we learn from the US? And maybe what can the US learn from Australia with respect to these matters? Um, well, there's, there's a couple of interesting things. One is that my understanding is that even though um, uh, there's not one America. So in other words, my, my, my children have spent quite a lot of time in parts of the States. So they've gone back to New York when they were babies. They don't even really remember it. Unfortunately, my family has now decamped to Boca Raton, Florida. So now they go to Boca Raton, Florida. And they think they know what the United States is. They think they know what it is, you know, what Americans are and what Americans are like. And, and I, it made me realize that I thought I knew what it was like to be an American too, that I, I understand America because I grew up in New York, so I know everything there is to know. But in fact, I don't. So Minnesota, I think, is probably quite a different place to New York. I think if you live on the coasts, I think you kind of generally get what being an American is on the coasts. And then I think there's the whole kind of flat, you know, wheat belt middle. And I don't actually know very much about that. Um, and I think that's a lot of the places where you have such antagonism to atheism. I feel quite confident um, that there were plenty of atheists when I was growing up and that it wouldn't have been such a terrible thing to have said one was an atheist. I think often it was even presumed. Um, if you were a particularly educated person, that certainly there would have at least been doubts. But nevertheless... There is also... Just hold on a minute. There's... Yeah. there's 
a misperception, I think, about... So there's a, conf, there's a contrast in Australia versus the United States. In Australia, people tend to be less religious. The convict history, I think, explains a lot of that. So I think you've got people who are coming um, disaffected with power because they were the poor, they were the marginalised, and of course the church was powerful. So even though I think there was probably a religiosity that was just the default, there was a lot of um, distrust of power and the church was included in that. So there's a... We didn't a, have the Puritan influence. We didn't have the Puritan influence, that's right. Um, but in contrast, I think we have a much worse situation legally because Australians are so cynical. So because Australians are so cynical, disconnected, and so sure that we're not religious, we're not like the United States, people constantly say that to me. Oh, you know, that I'll talk to them about something that's happening, and they'll say, oh, you know, but that's happening in America. We're completely different to that. In Australia, none of this stuff happens. And I really hate to break it to people, but mostly it's just because we're 20 years behind. Mostly that is the reason. So when I first got here, I thought Australia... <laughs> Oh, I thought Australia was Nirvana because Keating was in power, um, well, about to come into power, and Australians were just so progressive and they weren't doing any of the crazy things that were happening in the United States under Ronald Reagan. I thought I had found the most perfect country in the world, and it turned out that we just hadn't had John Howard yet. <laughs> so, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I wish more than anything, I live here, I love this country. I wish more than anything I could say we are just so much better than the Americans and so much more switched on, but we're really not. We're just mostly behind. Yeah. My, my fear, though, is that uh, at least parts of America are sort of exporting some of those more... Of course, and always... That, that, that's what it's always been. Puritan and puritanical ideas, and that's one of the things hmm. that we really have to... Uh, watch out for. Thus it has always been and in fact we are importing very directly for instance the United States and I'll just give you one quick example but there's millions of them. The United States was it's been very effective in terms of marshalling with the religious power um, of extreme religious yep. views and I think it's interesting that um, you know he said is in some ways you're missing the point that you're taking what's in the media as what Christians are and what Christians believe by the extremism that you see in the media and of course the media thrives off those extremes but but anyway they have this Christian breakfast they were running you know incredibly effectively so people were coming together across parties which if anyone knows anything about politics people across parties don't talk to each other and indeed even within parties Lots of people don't talk to each other because they're from different factions. So this organizing, you know, the us became, you know, the in-group, out-group. The us became we're religious and that overrides being Democrat or Republican. And this, of course, has had a huge impact on the American political system because these people are incredibly effective organizers and are doing really well. Yeah. We've started to do that here. Yes, yes. And it's that so has been extremely yeah. effective in the religiosity and effectiveness of religion impacting on the social... Um, fabric and on the political decisions that are made is happening because these people are organizing in group, out group. It's the religious against everyone else. We're heading towards 7.30 and that's the time that I really want to open up to you guys to make your comments and ask your questions. So I'm just going to ask the panel one last question, but when they're responding to that, can you get prepared with your questions and then we'll open it up. My last question is, this, the, the title of this program is The Road Less Table. Can we work together for the common good? But that begs the question, what is the common good? So, you know, what, what is, what are we heading towards if atheists and believers can work together, even should work together, but what are we heading for? Well, it's funny because I wrote in my notebook, what is the common good, when I was sitting down there. Um, and, I, and I guess, you know, again, I'll just start, I'll go back to where I started at the beginning. From my point of view, what a secular country offers. So the notion of religious freedom is the notion that we each should be free to believe or not believe what we like. It's nobody else's business. It's private. That's how I see it. And indeed, Again, the first time that I was asked to be in this atheist conference, that was kind of the first thing I thought too, was that what I believe is my own business. 
and nobody should really be in it. And when I think about politicians, you know, everyone's so excited that Julia Gillard said she was an atheist, and I kind of get it. I understand why people were excited, because it was the first time somebody had said it, and often there is this sense that somehow, you know, if things are private, it means they're secret, and that means they're shameful, and that means they're stigmatized. And so I get it. I get why people were excited about it. But the bottom line is, really, it shouldn't matter what she believes. It matters what she does. So I think for us, the common good is trying to get back to this notion that we should live in a secular state. And that means the public square is free of religion. That means our schools are free of religion. That means you know our government is free of, free of religion. But that we understand that people are allowed to believe whatever bloody thing they want, however stupid we think it is. And people do, religious and not religious, believe lots of stupid things. And yes, we should go for the idea of education and we should go for the idea that, you know, we should train people to think um, and reason. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a trained ethicist. I believe in all of that stuff. But at the same time, there are different dimensions and people can understand reason and use it and still have a part of themselves that likes spirituality. You know, there's a little, they think there now might be even a gene where people, you know, some people may have it, some people may not. There's a little string some people have, it needs to be plucked. And so they may still be able to think reasonably and still be people of faith. So there's a false dichotomy going on there. And as long as they're not trying to impose it on us, let them believe what they want. And we shouldn't be rid ridiculing them. Okay. It's disrespectful. PZ? What are we heading towards? If, if we do work for a common good, what is the nature of that common good? Okay. Well, you, now you just distract me for what she said. But um, I, I have to address a few things there. First of all, one, there's nothing wrong with being disrespectful. Uh, really. If you can't take a little disrespect... You're not, you're not a responsible member of the society because, you know, we, we are all going to be disrespected for some things, and that's, that's understood. Uh, what people are being disrespected for is not simply having faith. It's they are being disrespected for bringing this faith into the public square and imposing it on everyone else. And you cannot simply say, well... Your belief that every sperm is sacred is okay. You can because that has policy implications. No, and they use bias. It doesn't. Have oh, policy. if they yes, but that's they the thing. They try to impose it on us. It has policy implications. And that's the problem. They do try to impose it on us. Yes, we do and, that. And we do it every step. And one way to fight that is to ridicule it. And uh, we have to do that. Uh, also, it's it's not the case that this is some media portrayed extreme view of religion. You know, it's, it's, if you look at the American populace, every election cycle, roughly half of Americans are voting for the insane party in our country. <laughs> you know, the, the, you, you look at the Republican Party, this is, this is the Republican Party that says the Earth is 6,000 years old, that has a whole bunch of insane policies. You would think they would be laughed off the electorate, right? But they're not. That's because there is a significant number of people in that country, ha roughly half the people in that country, who think it's just fine to believe that the Earth is 6,000 years old, who do not see that as something to disqualify them from political office. When it should be that we have to, to get out there and make it clear that, yeah, this is, the Republicans are crazy. It's that simple, and we have to stop them. And you can't do that by being polite to them. Fortunately, I don't think we're quite that far, but we're catching up, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I want to thank PZ for reminding us of just how much work there is to be done, uh, to be done which is precisely why I think this work of trying to bri uh, build bridges between diverse communities is so important. You know, uh, both of you said something about taking sort of religion out of the public square. Um, I'm actually, I mean, I, I'm not... I know this probably isn't exactly what you meant, but I want to counter that. I actually want to see religion in the public square. In fact, I think it needs to be. I think, you know, in the United States, we live in a country 
where there is more religious diversity than there has ever been at any point in human history anywhere. But we also have these atrocious religious illiteracy rates. People know very little about religion. They know very little about what other people believe. And I think that that's directly contributing to a lot of these problems. I think we need to have frank, open, honest discussions about these things out in the open where everyone can talk about their religious beliefs so that we know what people believe and how that informs their actions. But I think we can do it in a civil way. And I think we don't have to look at somebody's religious beliefs and say that you know, we need to remove them in order to advance what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, Hitchens himself even said, you know, um, he said, you know, as long as you're not trying to impose your religious beliefs on me by violence and you're not trying to teach it in my schools as, you know, one religion is authoritative, then have your beliefs. That's fine. I'm concerned about secularism. And that is, that's a belief that I share as well. You know, I think that I have no reason to believe that a world absent of religion would be any less um, totalitarianistic or tribalistic. I have no reason to believe that simply removing religion from the equation will resolve our problems. So I'd rather, like you said, Leslie, I'd rather go directly to the source of the problem, which is, I think, you know, it's tribalism, it's a lack of, um, it's, it's not, you know, people not having access to education, it's people not having critical thinking skills, and it's people not acting compassionately towards those who are outside of their tribe. Um, so, you know, this idea of common ground, I think it's both a goal, and it's, but it's also a tool. We can, we can, you know, work towards trying to establish common ground between people who believe different things, but we can also then use that as a device to advance these issues that we all um, think are, are valuable and important. And, you know, I know that this conversation will sort of continue to come back to this this matter of terminology, this idea of, you know, should we do it under the banner of interfaith or not? But I think in the United States, you know, because our culture is so religious, we really don't have a choice right now. Um, the second march on Selma, for example, which was a march to advance racial equality, was an explicitly interfaith march. It was organized by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who put out a call to religious leaders and lay folks um, it was organized with a number of different religious folks, but it actually had a disproportionate number of atheists and humanists who were present and involved. But this march was called an interfaith march. There was a prayer that was a part of it. And, you know, some, if, if, if the idea is that because it's called interfaith, we shouldn't be there, I'm sorry. I think that the value of advancing racial justice and equality trumps religious criticism in that moment. It just does. You know, Sagan talked about finding a prudent balance. We need to evaluate every given situation and look at what values take the priority in that moment. And it's not always going to be a flat criticism of religion. It's just not. I know, I know you're vibrating for a change, yes. but um, I do want to open it up to some questions from the audience, if that's okay. Okay. So, oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, dear. How am I but remember, do remember, these questions have to be frank and open, and at the same time, civil and respectful. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a question from each quadrant of the room, all right, to try to be as fair as possible. And I'm going to start up with the... Can we grab one of the mics so we capture it on the, on the audio? Sorry, now you've got one between three. <laughs> I got it. Okay. <laughs> Up the, the back quadrant first. And the guy with the yellowish shirt on. I think you're all going to be coming to the after party, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Continue this, sure. please. Uh, this is a question for PZ. Uh, uh, can I first uh, ask, are you familiar with the psychology term cognitive dissonance, PZ? Yes. So somewhat, okay. I'm not sure if you, you are aware of this, but there are, there are scientists who, when they are in the lab, are amazing scientists, are, are flawless scientists. But when they leave the lab, they go and pray and they believe things. You, when you're in the lab, I'm sure you are a flawless scientist, as, as best you can be. But when you leave the lab, judging by your gut, you probably eat things you shouldn't. And, and I mean that with, and, I, and well, I mean that with disrespect, as you think it's important. Um, and so, why is your imperfection as a human not making you 
Uh, why, does it, why are you still better than other people's human perfection? Because he doesn't study nutrition science. Mm. He studies biology. He knows what's good for him. Okay. okay. Can we well, let him see if, respond to the question? First of, all, first of all, there's a peculiar assumption there that I think I'm better than other people, and I do not. So what I'm saying is, okay, if, if you want to make that argument, then don't put me in charge of the school lunch program, okay? <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would agree with you 100%. I'm not qualified to do that. And, and where, where have I claimed that they're not qualified to be scientists? You said if you don't have an instrument, don't play in the orchestra. But there are people who have instruments who don't play it outside of the orchestra, but when they're in the orchestra, they play it. So and why can't the human mind and play that, that's, play and and that's fine. So these, these religious scientists have the instrument. Yes. They can play it in the lab. I, I'm not, uh, that's exactly what I'm saying, right. is that's perfectly wonderful. Go do that. They're qualified to do that. But what I would also say is that their religious predilections play no role in the lab at all. If they do, they're bad scientists. Okay. Similarly, <laughs> yeah. so similarly we, have to, we have to get to the point where society keeps those same bad ideas of religion out of government out Thank of you. science, out of everything that's important to the public good. You know, that common good up there. Okay. Religion doesn't belong there. Next question, please, down the front here. Uh, hi, guys. Um, I see just amongst you three that there's a very big opposition between Chris and Leslie and PZ over, I guess, militant uh, atheism. I think um, I see that you guys want to find allies Whereas PZ sees it as that if you're finding allies that aren't, they aren't worth it, they're not following a f follow principles, because if you're looking for them in a certain way, uh, sorry, you, you just shook your head and it kind no, of threw me off. I, I disagree with what you're saying so far. <laughs> okay. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Get your yeah, questions. but uh, you guys, uh, Leslie and Chris, see it as a assimilation, maybe? You find having multiculturalism inside your movement of new atheism, while PZ is a bit more, uh, it, the way I see it is uh, faith and science are diametrically opposed, and that in order to have science you have to, I don't want to use, the word is purge, I guess, purge the faith out of it to get to science, whereas faith is in the opposite direction. So if you cater to that um, in the interfaith, you're not going towards science at all as a, as a direction. So, well, uh, hang on, but is, this a, is that a comment or do you I, also I, have a question? I was asking the question, do you, do, you, okay. do you guys see the multi multicultural and militancy? Do you see PZ as more militant? And... Um, well, I think, I think PZ, PZ said something quite interesting and, and I think he said something because I'm a political organiser as well, which in some ways is probably true, which is that if it is true that we need... Um, a new atheist movement in order to progress um, the uh, goal of, of returning to a secular society, then one way we may need to first form ourselves is by doing the in-group, out-group thing. And one of the ways you do that, because every bully, this is how bullies operate, right? We, we all know how schoolyard bullies work. You know, you create, you be mean to the other kids and you create the in-group, out-group. So you're the cool kids and they're the, you know, the geek kids and they're the other kind of kids. So there is, you know, this is how humans work. Um, we, we do operate by kind of in-group, out-group. That is one way we operate. But I guess what I would suggest, and you're right, you know, that might be called what's the militant, you know, atheism. Um, I, I just don't think that any of the premises around that are true. So I, I don't think it's true that um, we need, you know, I think atheists are one group amongst many who have a vested interest um, in wanting to uh, return to a, a secular, if it was ever the case that we ever had a secular state. I'm, I'm not a good enough historian to know if that's the case. But we are not the only ones. And indeed, as I was pointing out, it is in fact 
religious people, they were the minority religious people who were very concerned about protecting the secular state. So in Australia, for instance, it was the Catholics who were afraid of being overrun by the Protestants who were very interested in the notion of the secular state because atheists just weren't at that time out of the closet. I'm sure that they existed, but they just weren't kind of part of that conversation. And in the US, my understanding is that it was the Baptists who were actually worried about being overrun by other majority Christians. So they came up with the idea of religious freedom and they came up with the notion of keeping the, this, the, what I meant by the public square is not, you know, we can't talk about religion. I meant that in terms of the way government is operating, so out of the schools, out of the public institutions, that we don't establish a religion and we don't allow religious values, the religious values of one group, because of course, as we know, religions don't agree, um, to be imposed on all the rest of us. We keep that out of the public square. We, we operate on values that we all can share and we leave it so that everyone can decide for themselves what they do and don't want to believe and what they, how they do and don't want to practice. You can operate science without interfering with any of that. Okay, can I, sorry, can I give somebody else a chance to ask a question? Up the, just here, okay. thank you. I, sorry, I'm going to uh, change the topic completely. Back to um, something you were discussing earlier um, to do with the, the names, uh, for example, going under the banner of interfaith. Um, I, I would agree with um, PC that I, I don't like the idea um, as an atheist of being associated with under a banner of interfaith since I don't have faith, but I also really support the work that you're doing. Um, to me, it seems like an issue uh, similar to one that uh, feminist activists have in using pronouns that include females into things instead of automatically assuming that... Um, it's uh, under a male banner. Um, in the, using just the word interfaith without including non-faith um, suddenly makes uh, atheism or just anything under non-faith as being silent and invisible. Um, and that it's important to acknowledge the fact that you're being part of this interfaith and not just saying, I'm not going to be part of it because it's called interfaith, but actually actively working to say, we want to work with you, but that's not how we identify. Yeah, so I, I think I can actually say something about all three of the previous Ooh. questions. Um, because the, the, the thing is that as atheists, we have core values. We have certain core values. And we aren't going to compromise on them. And interfaith, all these other things, ask us to. I would say that number one for an atheist is truth. Do we have truth about religion? And the answer is no, that there is no God, this is all nonsense. And so, you know, if, for example, with the, the example in the back there of the scientists, I can work with a Christian who is a scientist because we can share the science values and I don't have to compromise my atheism, he doesn't have to com compromise his Christianity. And that's fine. As long as we can find those, the common ground where we can work together. It's just that in all too often, atheists are asked to compromise their central values in order to work with these other people. If we could have a system where we actually had honest <laughs> brokers instead of people like Chris Stedman, <laughs> who would say, we are working for equality, we're working for better art museums, we're working for you know, this policy in government without trying to label it with faith somehow, we'd be fine. We could, work, we could work with people of any faith on those issues in which we share common ground. So, I don't mean to be disrespectful, and you know that's true. Um, <laughs> But, but can I ask when the last time was you engaged in one of these intentional um, you know, efforts to bring people of different backgrounds together to do this work? Because you have a lot of criticisms for it. And I, I would be curious to know when was the last, because you say you know, these things aren't happening in these settings. You know, or um, and, you know, people aren't able to speak openly and honestly about you know, what they believe and what their values are as atheists. But that, you know, frankly, I don't find that to be the case at all when I'm doing these projects. So I'm, I'm curious. 
Well, like for instance, the Midwest Science of the Origins conference that we worked on a couple of weeks ago. I mean, was I not honest? What, what's the question again? Well, you, you yeah, asked. You're asking when, when I've done this sort of thing. And yes, that, that was an example of when I've done this sort of thing. I mean, you came to the speech and then you left afterwards. <laughs> you didn't engage in the projects that we did. So, how do you know oh. what occurred on the ground? I mean, I'm, I'm genuinely curious because, you know, even yes. before this Midwest Science of Origins conference, um, <laughs> Hang on. You know, you oh. had, before this conference actually even happened, you know, you've written a number of different things about interfaith on your blog, and I, I always wonder, you know, what your experiences have been with it, because the, the way that you portray and describe interfaith efforts is completely divorced from the reality that I experience when I actually engage in them. So I'm okay. Uh, yeah. uh, Chris and PZ, can I leave that question hanging and I invite you to okay. discuss it over a drink later on because <laughs> I just, I really want to give a few other people in the audience a chance. Well, there was, there was something, there was another question there though that I had just one quick thing, more thing I wanted to say, which is, you know, this terminology question of interfaith. And when I started working, um, so I, I worked for the Interfaith Youth Corps, which is an organization in the United States that works to mobilize people of different backgrounds to engage in these kinds of projects and try to build cooperation and understanding. And when I first started there, a lot of the language was very religious centric. And that's sort of understandable because it was a lot of religious people who came together and created this program and they weren't, they, it was a blind spot, right? They weren't really thinking about non-religious folks. And a lot of that is because of how marginalized they are in the United States. So when I started working there, you know, over the course of the few years that I was there, the language completely changed. So now the name of the organization remains the Interfaith Youth Corps, and they still talk about interfaith work. But any time they're describing what it is, in all of their materials, they always say religious and non-religious individuals, you know, people of different religious and philosophical perspectives, uh, religious and non-religious values. I mean, they're always, they are always moving, they're, in an, they're moving toward more accurately describing what happens. I agree that the, you know, the term, but uh, the interfaith movement in the United States is still so young in its current iteration that I think, you know, there's a real opportunity for us to get in there now and make sure that the language uh, actually describes what is going on there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good evening. Can I uh, have a, yes, up the back. I'm a member from Interaction. Uh, we also use the same uh, terminology. We are people of faith and, and non-faith. Um, to PZ, uh, my question is, you're talking about the issue of creating a self and other dichotomy with the new, in, uh, new atheist movement. Um, when do you think the walls will come down? Once that's been fortified enough, when do you think meaningful action can take place? And secondly, as someone who is a, a symbol like uh, Mr. Dawkins for the atheist movement, do you uh, believe that your own actions are great um, messages and uh, symbolic for other atheists to live their life by ethically? Uh, do you believe your behavior is something that can be um, uh, seen as a, a I'll try to word that, but emulate. yeah, emulate. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's a couple questions. Uh, the first question, uh, the walls will come down when a religion is eradicated. How's that sound? Or more properly, when religion has adopted its proper role, when, it, when religion is treated as something personal and private that people can freely engage in on their own free time but have absolutely no sense that they can impose it on others. That's what we're waiting for. That's what we're trying to get. And I think as, as atheists, what we have to do is, you know, stick our elbows out and cause some trouble and tell people, no, it's time to make some room for secular causes here. Uh, the second part of your question, I'm a little, something about role models? What? Oh, hell yes, yes. No. The, you know, the, 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 I, okay, the idea of the role model, though, is not that I want people to be like me. I want people to be themselves. And that means speaking out freely and openly about their own opinions. And that means often, that means often being disrespectful. You know, I, I, 
I respect people who are disrespectful to me. That's a fine thing to do. <laughs> and, and, and that whole idea that we've got to be civil to everybody in the sense of we can't speak openly and frankly about what we think of their views is, I, I, I think it's a real stumbling block to getting anywhere. Okay, can we have the next question, please? Um, in, uh, in terms of, in religious faith, we've got uh, underlying faith, you've got um, a suspension of reason for a personal bias to serve emotional purposes. Um, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. All right. In, uh, in cognitive psychology, we know that beliefs influence, uh, beliefs influence behavior, specific, uh, specifically beliefs in response to various events. And uh, yeah, because they influence emotions and emotions influence behavior. And the way that it's dealt with in cognitive psychology is to uh, go after the thinking errors behind those beliefs. This is for Chris and Leslie. Can you see the value in what PZ does when he attacks the faulty thinking behind those beliefs? Because you don't just find those beliefs manifest in religion, you find them manifest, as Sam Harris says, in dogmatism generally, like Nazism, communism, things like that. There's, to me, there's two separate projects here. So one is, I think it's really important, and if I could mandate one thing, I would probably mandate that everyone in the world has to take, um, you know, a, a thinking class, you know, a class in reason and evidence. If I, because I'm a researcher as well, so I'm I'm dearly attached to all of these things, um, and I think it's really important. But I guess for me, the main confusion is around this idea that. You know, what for me atheism means is it means you don't believe in a metaphysical being. You don't believe in God. That's all it means. So you can not believe in God and not be a very reasonable thinker and not necessarily love science and not necessarily adore reason. We've added all these things on and confused the whole spectrum. And then, of course, the opposite becomes true, that if you are a person of faith, you therefore don't believe in reason, um, you, you don't have any kind of capacity to ha have logic and you hate science. And those, the, those things are just illogical, those are not actual logical connections. So I think we've just confused the whole arena by connecting them all up. Um, and if we, uh, if we disconnect them, then you can have exactly as that young man suggested, and, and we know to be the case, that we can have scientists who actually are people who are religious. In the Melbourne University Philosophy Department, I can tell you that some of the most intelligent, erudite, reasoned you know, pe people, people who would cut you to shreds in terms of their capacity to think reasonably and logically, they go to church. It is just a fact. So we need to deal with it. Sorry, can I have another question? Thank you. Um, I have a question for Leslie and Chris. Uh, probably not um, PZ, because I think he's going to disagree with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he can answer anyway. Um, what do you think of Alain de Botton's suggestion um, that we should be learning about non-supernatural aspects of religion? Uh, and I know this might not be the primary issue at hand, but do you think this could be beneficial uh, for the atheist community? I'm sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? I yes. Um, what do you think of Alain de Botton's suggestion about learning from non-supernatural aspects of religion? Did you get that? Alain de Botton? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, de Botton. I'm not quite finished with the book, but I'm reading it um, at the moment. <laughs> and, uh, not familiar? Yeah, sorry. Well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to sort of sort out my thoughts. I mean, you know, I haven't written a review of the book yet, um, and there's a reason for that, because I, you know, I have mixed feelings on, on the book. I think there is, there's something valuable about looking at where religions have succeeded in transmitting ideas, in building you know, infrastructure and support for people's lives, and creating opportunities for people to engage with their, you know, their the world. I mean, there was a, a, a work that came out um, a year or so ago called American Grace. It was by a couple of researchers who <laughs> did this huge study on the lives of religious Americans. And what they found was that religious Americans you know, are far and away much more civically engaged than non-religious Americans. Um, and you know, so they, they vote more, they participate in their broader communities more, they um, you know, are much more likely to give to charity, both religious and secular charities, but that the correlation between these things was actually, had, it was not about the intensity of an individual person's uh, belief, but it was about intensity of religious affiliation. 
So it was how involved they were in their religious communities. It was how frequently they attended church or that kind of thing. And so, you know, what we do at the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard is we um, support, you know, essentially myself and some other staff members, our community organizers. We listen to what the people in our community are interested in doing, and we try to create, you know, organize opportunities for them to, to do those things. And so, you know, there is, there is something to be said about looking at in general, not just in terms of community, but in other ways, how religions have been successful um, at enriching people's lives. Because certainly, you know, religions have done a lot of harm, but they've also done a fair amount of good. I studied liberation theology in Latin America, where, the, you know, the Catholic Church was instrumental in uh, fighting a lot of the oppressive government um, activities that were going on there. So it's useful to look at why these things have worked and see how we might, you know, learn from that. Now, we have an advantage because we don't have to sort of deal with a lot of the you know, supernatural aspects that come along with that. But you know, I think there's something valuable there. Now, there's some things about Alinda Bhattan's book that I find problematic, but I realize you know, we have limited time, so yeah. I'll stop there. OK. <laughs> we have one time for one last question, and then we're going to have to wrap up, because I want to let you guys get to the after party. Please. Hi. Uh, this question is for Leslie uh, regarding the wafer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sorry to bring yes. that can of worms up again, but um, as, as far as I see it, the issue is not so much what, what they do with their wafers, but the fact that they are in fact expecting us to treat their wafer also as God. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, if, and how, how do you suppose, if, if, if we cannot um, abolish this patently ridiculous idea that, that we should be uh, doing as they do uh, with their wafers or, you know, if we, uh, you know, any, any, other, any other thing that, um, that a, a religion does that, that they think we should also be doing. How can we expect that we can abolish the idea that we don't have the right to do what we want with our bodies or our relationships? Look, it's a great question. It's a great question, and I ha I've had to think really, really hard about this. Um, it's not an easy one to, to think through, but the, the thing that got me to where I am with it is I thought about Aboriginal people, and I thought about some of the customs that they have that go to things like the dreaming, you know, that they think certain places on, uh, in Australia are sacred. Would I, because they're not sacred to me, and I, I don't have those feelings about them, would I say, that's stupid. That's bloody ridiculous. It's just a bloody piece of ground. Can't you goddamn see it? No, I would not. And I wouldn't because they're not trying to make me worship it. It's not imposing on my life. And therefore, even though it's not a belief that I see as particularly rational, I would shut my mouth. I, well, because I wanted to climb the rock, if I wanted to climb the rock, I would climb it. But I wouldn't, and if they asked me to do things, so for instance, as we know, there's certain things you're supposed to do. You know, there's certain customs. And I haven't, I haven't actually climbed Uluru, so I don't know particularly what they are, but my guess is that around a number of the Aboriginal sites, there are certain things you probably should not shouldn't do. And I wouldn't go and do those things just to show them how stupid I thought their customs were. Now, there's the difference. That's because, you know, I'm not being made to go there. It's not imperative that I go there. And I just don't think it's important enough. But as you know, reproductive rights are incredibly important to me. That's the point at which, because they believe it, I have to do it. Because they believe it, we all have to do it. That's the point at which it becomes problematic. And there are differences. So there are all gradations along the line. And you're right, at some place you draw the, the line. And of course, it's always going to be somewhat you know, subjective. And someone might draw it here, and someone might draw it there. But somewhere on the extremes, there's laughing at Aboriginal dreamtime customs. And I don't want to do that. I, I do want to say one thing about that, though. And that, that is that there are other exceptions where you do have to ridicule this. You, you know where the whole idea that you can't desecrate the communal wafer comes from, right? Do I know the idea? Yeah. The the line? That's what they say. But it was actually... <laughs> you know, the, the, orig, the, the, uh, the origination of this myth is it was used to excuse pogroms. 
Yes, in the 14th century, what they would do is, is when they wanted to clear out the Jews in the neighborhood, they would make up these amazing stories about the Jews coming in and wanting to use those communion wafers in their rituals because obviously since it was Jesus, it was very powerful. <laughs> and the common thing they would do is drive nails through it to extract the blood of Jesus so that they would desecrate. desecrate. Uh, and there's a number of well-known massacres in Europe of entire Jewish communities driven by this myth. So in that case, you know, of course the Catholic Church has gotten a little better since then. <laughs> they haven't burned anybody in the stakes since the 19th century. But in that case, I think that would be a case where you would say, no, I have, I have an obligation to debunk this story. And so it's, it's, been, it's been a source of abuse for centuries, and I think it's, it's legitimate to point out that this belief is damaging and dangerous. And like you say, when they tell you, well, you have to respect our cracker and you can't do anything to a cracker outside of the church, I think it's, it's time to stand up and say, no, don't, don't mess with that. No, 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 hang on. That's whoa, the link. Whoa. That is the link for everybody, is the point at which it becomes dangerous and damaging. I think you can see that this conversation is going to go on. And uh, I invite you to join our discussants at the after party at Embiggen Books. Jump on a tram, go to the State Library, turn left. Uh, What's the address, please? 197 Little Lonsdale. 197 Little Lonsdale Street. It's just at the back of the State Library. Can I, before everybody starts to uh, leave, can I just thank my colleagues from the Humanist Society? <laughs> and from Interaction, and I know that there are a number of people from different faith communities here, so can we thank them too? And finally, there are uh, people from the University of Melbourne Secular Society uh, who have helped out as volunteers. And of course, we all know that none of this happens without volunteers. So thank you very much. <laughs>